So whatever. I'm sorry. Let's just take it from the top. Sorry, guys. All right. Well, welcome, everybody. I'm Martin Tyner with the Southwest Wildlife Foundation. And uh, welcome to our little chat this evening. And we're going to cover the topic called imping, and along with a, a couple of other topics as well. And um, I brought us a, a very special friend that you just meet at the end. I'm, I'm here with Doug, so I, I guess we're here in DG just fine. And so what imping is, so, so that you understand, imping is the replacement uh, of a damaged feather primarily used on birds of prey to keep their feather condition in excellent excellence so that they can fly well. If you're an, aerope, an apex predator, you're diving out of the sky at, at 100, 200 miles an hour. It's extremely important to be in very, very good feather condition. Uh, just imagine an airplane with a, with a tiny hole that does affect the airplane, but not very much. But if you have a lot of holes, the airplane doesn't fly anymore. And so we must keep the feathers in good condition. Now, with the wild birds, feathers get damaged. This is completely normal, but every little damage to the feather does impede their flying ability a tiny bit. And, and so the major feathers, we call the flight feathers, which is the, the, the 12 tail feathers and on the wing, the primary feathers and secondary feathers that you find on, on the wings, the larger feathers are the most important ones to keep in good condition. And in the wild, the hawk does a great job of trying to protect those feathers and keep them good. But um, when feathers do get damaged, uh, I, I have um, had lots of requests from people to talk about imping because they don't, they've seen some videos of, of lots of feathers being um, uh, re-glued into a, a bird's tail or wings so that the bird can fly away more quickly and not be in rehab nearly as long. And, um, and they wanted to know why I don't do that. And so what we're going to do this evening, and please, if you have questions, please feel free to, to send us a question and, and we'll try to answer it for you. But let me talk about the process and how it works and, and uh, so that you kind of understand uh, what, we're, what we're doing here. Now, this is right here. This is, this is a feather. Uh, this, is, this is a deck feather, a center deck feather from, from Belle, my Harris hawk. And so this, this is her deck feather. And here's a second deck feather from Bell the Harris Hawk. Now we have uh, one deck feather is, is the right side. The other deck feather is the left side center deck feather. Um, if I break this feather, I cannot replace it with this one because the, the feather will bend slightly in a, in a different direction. If that, does that make sense to everybody? So in order to imp feathers into a bird, you must replace the exact feather. And so if you don't have the exact feather, then you, you, you're out of luck. You can't replace it. And the way that we re replace these feathers, in fact, if you can see here, I, I, it's a little hard to see, but this is how the feathers line up. But if I change it around to this side, um, th then there's a gap. They don't line up right. Does that make sense to everybody? And, and, and so you, ha you have to have the right feather going into the right so uh, feather socket, period. Um, and so um, as, as a rehabber and as a falconer, I, I, um, I, I collect feathers and, and so that I have a, a, a big collection and then I have to go through my collection, whatever feather is broken on the, on the bird, I have to replace the right one. Now this is Harris Hawk, this is Bell. Even though the Harris Hawk and the Red tailed Hawk are of similar size, I can't put Harris Hawk feathers on a Red tailed Hawk, the feathers would not line up properly. I can't put Swainson's hawk feathers on a red-tailed hawk, even though they look very similar. You have to have the exact correct feather. Now, what imping is, is let's say you've got a feather with damage. Now, this one, you know, you can see there's a little damage right here at the tip. That's not very much damage. That's just a tiny bit. It, and, and this would have very little effect on the bird's ability to fly and to steer correctly. Placing, but but uh, a, and so you're missing that much feather uh, on the bird, and you're going well. Gee, that really does kind of affect the 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 flight characteristics a little bit. I think I'm going to replace that feather, and that's and and so in falconry we can do that, and the way we do that is is we will choose the right feather. 
and then we will take the right the correct feather and we will measure on our bird where the feather goes into the body now on this feather on the on my harris hawk it's about a half inch it's about that much that actually sticks into into the cuticle or the socket in the bird so that much is in the bird and the rest of the feather sticks out and so we'll cut the feather about a half inch back um, from where it enters the bird so you got about a half inch here and and so this this is in the bird about that deep but we'll have that much sticking out now the feather is hollow as you can see here it's a straw and that's and that's what we want that's completely hollow but now we have to take the new feather that's that's in good shape that's not damaged and we have to figure out a way to get that to go in here. And the way we do that is we basically take a little wooden, there we go. Now we, we can use wood. Uh, some people have used carbon fiber. There's a variety of things that we can do, but we will make a, a little pin. Um, and these little pins will glue the little pin into the feather. And that's what I've got right here. See, I've got that pin and I've got it glued into the feather about halfway, you know, so the about halfway down the pin is in the feather. And then this second half, we need to glue this into into the the leftover shaft right here, the the leftover shaft that we've left inside the bird. And so now there's a variety of glues that people use. Um, some people like to use crazy glue um crazy glue sets very very quickly now this is thick crazy glue and i've used this in the past but this sets up very very fast even though it's the the slow crazy glue sets up very very quickly uh and if you don't have this feather lined up perfectly then it, it causes more problems uh, than it than it would to have not done it at all uh some people like to use um basically two-part five-minute epoxy and you mix up the epoxy and you got five minutes to play with in in time uh to get the feather absolutely perfect and there's it's going to be hard for you guys to see let me turn this thing around see if you can see it a little bit now you're not going to see it there's a little bit of white where where you can it, there's actually a little bit of a white line and you can see on that white line the alignment that, that you need and my alignment is uh see if i can get it over here my alignment my alignment's right there that's the alignment for for it to go in and stay in properly so i have to have it lined up perfectly because if this is in the bird and the feather is tilted sideways now we've got a problem now this feather isn't going to function properly and it, it'll interrupt the airflow over the other feathers and make it a lot worse so you have to have this absolutely perfect inside the bird and so uh something i like to use is this is a a, a very high quality uh contact cement and this gives me about uh, about a minute or two to play with it. And so I can put the contact cement, glue it into the feather. We've taken the measurements. We know exactly how long the pin needs to be, how long the pin needs to be uh, to slide into the bird. So we've got all those measurements done. And now once we've got that lined up, um, we put a little co the contact cement and then shove it all the way in so it fits properly. And then once we've got it in place, we have to keep that stable and not move for a couple of minutes. And that's to replace one feather. Now, some people will use um, thread to reinforce where it's glued in. Uh, some people will use uh, dental floss as thread because it's waxed. To, to to wrap and reinforce where it's where it's gone in there's a lot of you know there's a lot of people that have a lot of different theories and a lot of different techniques for for having these feathers stay as permanently as possible to get in there but there is a there is a drawback guys and that is the feather actually gets its strength from its flexibility and so if it doesn't have flexibility it loses its strength. And so anytime we put in a rigid piece of this, this happens to be bamboo, a rigid piece of bamboo in here, or even carbon fiber or, or fiberglass or whatever you want to try to use it in here, that stiffens this up 
And so it puts a greater amount of stress where the doubt, where the little pin, the wooden pin stops. And, the, and this becomes more rigid. And so if it gets hit hard, instead of flexing, it breaks. And then what you end up with, instead of this much, this much damage to the tail feather, you end up with that much damage to the tail feather because this is now broken and 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 would have to be replaced or or removed completely. And so there is a risk to doing the imping that that the feathers can be de it can make the feathers so it doesn't flex well enough and you end up doing more damage than you than just by leaving the partially broken feather in the first place. So that's that's part of the issue. Now here's the next issue and this is the part that, that I, I'm going to talk to you guys about, and I want you to understand. Um, I'm I'm going to show you uh, uh, um, a Swainson's hawk that came in yesterday. Now, the Swainson's hawk that came to me yesterday um, was dead on arrival, a and in order to kind of show where these go in the bird and and how we have to handle the bird and that kind of stuff is very, very stressful to the bird. And I didn't want to use one of my live birds and stress them unnecessarily. And, and so I do have a dead one. If this really bothers you uh, for the next maybe five minutes or 10 minutes or so, please, um, you know, you know, go get a cup of coffee or a, or a soda pop and come back in just a few minutes because I'm going to show you a bird that is dead. It was hit by a car. Um, it's got a really neat story to it, but it but it it is a dead bird, and it and it allows me to kind of show you the rest of the process that that I I that I just didn't feel comfortable showing to you using a live bird. Now, a, as complicated as this, pr this process is, and everything has to be absolutely precise, which means the bird has to be has to be extremely still. Now you you can take the bird to a veterinarian, and they can be put under anesthesia. And with the bird under anesthesia, um, there is a risk. Just like you and I, if we go under anesthesia, there is always the risk of complications from the from the anesthesia, from the medication, and birds even more so, because their respiratory systems are far more uh, delicate than our respiratory systems. So I don't want to youth or to anesthetize a bird. Um, if I absolutely don't have to. And so the process that has been used for 4,000 years, the process is to basically hood and contain the bird. Um, it's, it's called casting your bird. And, and that is so that the bird cannot move. So please, everybody, um, this beautiful little Swainson's hawk, um, it's, it's, last job on this planet is to help educate you guys. And so I'm going to show you this little Swainson's hawk and show you what we do here. Now, here's our little Swainson's that we've got right here. And, and again, it was hit by a car. It arrived dead. There was nothing we could do to help it. And so when we cast a bird, it, that just basically means we put the hood on and here's the hood. And so if this, if this was a, a, a healthy bird, the hood blindfolds the bird and helps to keep the bird calm so it doesn't become as stressed. And as you see, what I've got on the bird right here is I've got an, a nylon stocking pulled over and I've got some um, tape, this is masking tape, to hold, the bird, in, to hold the, the bird nice and still. It's wrapped around the wings, wrapped around the feet, so the bird is completely stable and doesn't move. Because if the bird moves, we're not gonna get that feather lined up properly. And if you can only imagine, one feather could be a really pro big problem. Can you imagine having to do 12? This is why we don't do that. This, this is why we, want, we only, re, only replace one, two, maybe absolute most three feathers. But here's the tail of our bird. And, and so we're gonna show this to you here. Um, let's see if I can stand up and show this to you a little bit better. Okay, here's the, here are the feathers. You can see the feathers right there. This is the shaft coming in that we ha have on the feathers where it enters the body. And so we will cut the feather a half inch from the body. So we have the, have the space that we need. And then we will do that process of taking a good quality feather and we'll, we will imp it in as, you, as I've showed you before. 
And so that that is how we do it. But again, the bird has to be completely still because any misalignment really messes up the bird's ability to fly properly. And I, I, I've been asked because people have seen a video where they were at a vet and the bird was anesthetized and they were replaced not only um, one, but they replaced the entire tail. And then, and then also they replaced some of the, the, the secondary wing feathers as well. Um, and so this process to do one feather correctly, uh, it takes me probably for one feather, 10 minutes, maybe 15 minutes uh, to, of the bird being perfectly still for me to do this properly. Uh, so you multiply that by 12, and if you do wing feathers, 15, 20 feathers. And so the bird is under anesthesia for a very, very, very long time. And for me personally, it's not worth the, the risk to the bird. And so, and so I will replace a feather if needs be. Um, but I, I, I would much rather if, if the bird's feathers are in such bad condition, like the, the red-tailed hawk that we have that's just about ready for release right now. It's been with me for months and months and months. Uh, and this red-tailed hawk had all of its tail feathers ripped out. I would much rather keep the bird for a few months and allow the feathers to grow back in normally and completely um, and not risk anesthesia and not risk the stress of, of casting the bird uh, and, and the potential for stress and injury. So that's why I, I do that. Now, does anybody have any questions about the imping before we start talking about a, a few other subjects that we can answer for you? Um, we did have a question about if the bird feels the process. Does the bird feel the process? Well, the truth of the matter is um, what a feather is, is a feather is extremely well-organized hair. And so um, just like with your hair, you get a haircut and you don't feel a thing because your, your hair is actually dead and the feather is actually dead. Um, and, so, and so there's no blood in here. There's no nerve endings or anything else in, in the feather. Where the feather goes into the body, about about that much that it's in the body and there's tissue around it, yes, that is, the bird can feel that. But as far as this sliding in here and gluing into place, there, there is no discomfort, there is, there is no uh, problem uh, harming the bird uh, and making it uncomfortable. So there's, there's no issue with, with that at all. Other questions? Mr. Moon asked, have you experimented with other materials like composites? I have. I've used carbon fiber. I've used fiberglass. Uh, I have used um, uh, aluminum. I have used uh, stainless steel. I have used a, ver a variety of different kinds of woods. Um, this, these are made out of, out of bamboo. And, and what's nice about this is this is very cheap. Um, and you can go to any grocery store in, in North America and you can buy these um, in their uh, Chinese food section of the store. Uh, and then you just shape them down from this to this. Um, and, and so you just shape them down to be the right thickness and the right length that you need. Uh, and so and then the, the bamboo actually holds the glue very, very well. And so there's a variety of, way, of ways that you can do that. But yes, I've tried other things, and to be honest with you, the bamboo has, has worked really, really, really well for me. Uh, but that's not to say it's the best way. That's just the way that it's, that it's worked for me personally. Okay. Other questions? Dana asks, can they still preen that feather afterwards? They can, and, and again, therein lies one of the problems that we have. Um, the risk, we fix the feather. It's glued in. Everything, everything, it's straight, it's pretty, it's perfect, and it's, and it's completely, looks completely normal, and the birds can preen, and, and everything is fine. But if you get a bird that's a little bit, gets a little bit agitated, or a little bit, uh, a little more neurotic, or a little bit more picky, they know that this is here. They know that th this is artificial in here. And I have had birds in the past not like this artificial uh, joint that we have here in the feather 
and then start to pull and pull and pull and bend and break. And then you have this left. And so again, the, one of the, one of the, the problems with imping is we started off with, you know, this much feather, um, damaged that we wanted, wanted to fix. And now what we've ended up with is now we're missing an entire feather. Uh, and so that is a risk that some birds just um, just won't tolerate an, an imped feather and they'll pull it out. Not all birds, but some birds do. And it's something to be aware of. And so you, you have to judge the, the risk factor. You know, is it worth replacing uh, a feather that's broken a third down? Um, yes, it does affect the flight, but not a whole lot. Um, versus the risk of if the bird doesn't like it and decides to rip it out. And now you have... You now the feather's completely gone. And at that, it's oftentimes that, that, little, that little end in there that's inside the bird, oftentimes in the process that gets damaged, so you can't use it again anyway. And so the feather will not be replaced anyway until next year when the bird grows all new feathers. And see, that's where these feathers come from. Um, this is Bell's, and every year, Bell grows a new set of flight feathers which the flight feathers are the, are the, the tail feathers, the, the primaries and secondary wing feathers, the larger feathers that are on a bird, and they replace all of them every year, plus a lot of the you know, culverts and body feathers and those kinds of things, but they replace these every year. And in the process of doing so, when she drops a feather, I will collect it and so that I have them, and if I decide that I need to, to do a replacement, I can do a replacement. Um, but uh, in, in most cases, um, I don't usually get too aggressive about replacing feathers uh, because I, I know the risk. And, and I would much rather her fly with, uh, with one broken feather than a, a feather completely missing because she decided she didn't like it, the new one put in. Now, what, what you see here, you can see this little metal thing on the feather. Okay, that little metal thing is, is a small clip. And I make these. And this is an attachment point uh, for uh, a GPS tracking system. And see, that's very, very small. It doesn't affect the bird's flight in any way, shape, fashion, or form. Now, there is, again, there is a risk that if the bird decides it doesn't like this, they can break this feather taking this off. Again, this is just clipped on using a little contact cement. And it's very... Um, you know, it's very light and it doesn't affect the bird. Now, this is her, th this is a, a, a very normal uh, GPS transmission system that we use to put on the bird. So when we're out and my birds are flying free, and these are my wildlife ambassadors, this is my, my golden eagle and my harris hawk when they're out flying free and hunting rabbits and stuff. I have this little tracking tracker on them, and that, that allows me, if they, if they end up a long distance, you know, half a mile, mile, three or four, five miles away, I, I can, this sends a signal to a receiver that Bluetooths to my phone, and I can look at my phone, and I have um, a, a uh, app on the phone that shows uh, the, the exact GPS location and the terrain, so I can go right to where the bird is uh, as the bird is eating its rabbit and go, and go get its breakfast. And the way these things work, again, if you can imagine, here's this on the tail of the bird. This is the bird's tail feather. And um, all we have to do to attach it is we've got a little sp got little springs here. We push the springs together, and we slide the spring. Let me get it up here so you can see. We slide the spring into the clip, and now that's it. A and now that f that uh, won't just fall off. Now the bird can certainly pinch it and take it off if they want to, but it's a little hard to do. Um, and again, if you just push it in, it comes right out. But this gives us the opportunity to track the birds when they're out flying completely free. You know, my eagle especially goes thousands of feet in the sky, flies with the wild eagles. And he'll spot a rabbit three to five miles away. And if, if I'm not really successful at flushing rabbits up close, he'll fly one a long ways away. And my job is to go track him down. So we have these on our birds to help us track them down. And so that's what the, the telemetry is for. It doesn't get our bird back. It just tells us uh, kind of where they are and allows us to get 
uh, close to them so that we can call them back to us and they're not miles away. And so that's, this is, um, you know, these transmitters, this is the greatest invention for falconry when falconry is 4,000 years old and everything's pretty much old fashioned. I mean, the hoods are very, very old te technology. Um, the equipment I use is, is 4,000 year old technology, but this is my piece of modern technology that, and it does nothing more than allow me to, to locate the bird and get close to it. So any, if there's questions about the telemetry I use, I'm, I'm happy to answer those for you. Um, any questions, DG, that I need to answer? Well, we have questions going back to the imping. Uh, Randall asks, sure. does imping interfere at all with natural molting? No, it does not interfere with, with the, the natural molt at all. Because as you can see with this feather, you know, this is molted out, this feather was molted out as well, but it molts out, which basically means when the new feather starts to grow in the socket, the new feather pushes the old feather out. And the feather falls out just like this as one solid piece. And, and so the new feather grows, as the new feather grows back in, um, the, at, once the feather is completely grown back in, um, there's a, a protein shaft that covers the feather full of blood. And, and as the feather grows out of that protein shaft, the shaft peels away. And then you end up with a s nice, solid, hollow, straw-like feather. And, and that will remain there until, until next year. So it doesn't affect the molt in any way. Arnaldo asks, but does the contour have to match the original feather? It has to match the contour, the length, uh, the thickness, the flexibility. You, you know, I, I cannot take just a feather and imp it into a bird that has a broken feather. I have to take the feather from a bird uh, from the, the same species and the same exact feather. As I, as I said earlier, you know, he, you know, this is a right to left deck feather for my Harris Hawk. They are, they are not interchangeable. So I cannot imp this feather into that socket. It, it just, it just doesn't line up appropriately and we have to have them lined up appropriately. So even within the, the, the individual species, uh, I cannot substitute a feather, even if even if, if it looks identical, it's not. And so to do it properly, you have to have the right feather for that bird's feather that was lost. Birdie Mom Carol asks, if you don't replace the feather, how long does it take for them to grow in on their own? The, depending on the on the on the location on the planet obviously in the southern hemisphere it's a little different than the northern hemisphere but we'll we'll just stay with the northern hemisphere uh basically birds um will start their molt around the time they hatched and so when a bird is hatched when it's a the, the very next year and so if a bird is let's say hatched in may um then then usually april or may june the bird will start losing it's large feathers, and with a bird of prey, it only loses uh, one or two feathers at a time. And it doesn't lose all of its feathers at once, and so it takes about six months for the bird to go through an entire molt. So, um, in the southern hemisphere, it it uh, it would be different because their seasons are different than ours. But it but it all all revolves around uh, when the when the bird hatched, and so Bell, my Harris hawk. Uh, she was hatched. She was an early hatch. She hatched on the 22nd of March. And so r right around the end of March, the 1st of April, she will drop her first feather and start and start growing new ones. And 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 the process will will take her through August. And she's usually pretty close to done molting by September. But if you have a bird that was hatched in July, um, you know, it, they'll start molting in July and they not, may not be ready to fly until December. So it, it takes five, six months for the feathers to grow and go through a complete molt. Academic Ant asks, can a bird with an imp feather go back in the wild? A bird with one imp feather can go back in the wild. And with two imp feathers, yeah. Three, you're kind of pushing it. Um, an entire... 12 tail feathers no there are people that, that do imp the feathers in and they do put them back in the wild um 
I don't think that's appropriate. Uh, like like I said, you when you put them back in the wild, you you don't know if they're going to just uh, fly away, and then a day or two later they're going to look out those um, those seams right here and say, you know, this is not normal, this is not natural, I don't like this, and I'm going to rip out all of these feathers that have been artificially placed, and now you've got a bird with no tail. You just don't know. And, and so I, I would not, for me personally, I, w I will not um, do more than two, three at the absolute most. I don't think I've ever done three imped feathers on a bird that I've released back to the wild. So that's, that's just, I mean, that's my perspective. Um, there are other people that think, see it differently than I do, but, um, you know, and, and that's probably something I need to, to, to talk about just a tiny, tiny bit. Um, there's so much information out here on YouTube and there's so many people with so many different kinds of ideas and it really is inappropriate for me to, for me to say, um, the way I do it is right. And what I saw in the YouTube video is wrong. The guy, the guy or gal or whoever is 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 doing it inappropriately, because I don't have the whole story. When you see me taking care of uh, sick, injured, and orphaned wildlife here on on my channel, you only see just a tiny, tiny piece of what of everything that we're doing uh, to to help these animals. And so it's it you really don't have the ability to to judge and say that somebody's doing it right or somebody's doing it wrong. Um, you know, I'm always open to people calling or sending me a question and saying, you know, I saw you do this. Can you, can you tell me why you do it this way? And I'm more than happy to answer it. But I do get, uh, I do get emails um, occasionally where people saying, I saw this on YouTube and you're doing things completely wrong. So obviously you don't know what you're doing. And that's very inappropriate. Um, I would not do that to, to another rehabber I, because I just don't know this is extremely complicated and I don't know all of the issues that the rehabber is going through and and, and everything that are, that they're done so you know all you, all you can do is is um, respect that there's an individual out there that's trying to help these animals and and I'll tell you what anytime I see somebody come up with a new idea something that really looks I'm going wow that's a good idea I need to try that and if it works hey I love it and if it doesn't work, then I'm going, okay, well, that doesn't work for me. It may be perfectly good for that other individual, but it doesn't, it doesn't work with the way I do things. And, and um, you know, we, we try to be kind of respectful. Yes, how you doing, sweetie? We'll get to you in just a minute. So back to our, back to our little Swainson's hawk. This Swainson's hawk, and, and please forgive me, I'm going to bring the, the, the dead Swainson's hawk out again. This little Swainson's hawk... Uh, was hit by a car and is and like I said came to us dead. Now usually when they are when they come in and they're and they're dead, there's not, nothing I can do. You know I can't fix them, um, and, and and so in most ca cases the uh, the the state fishing game don't bring the dead ones to me because there's nothing I can do for them. But this particular one actually had a federal ban uh, on her. And and she, and it was really really quite unique. I was kind of uh, you know I've gotten other birds in with bands and that's just fine. We don't have an issue with that. But this particular band and I took the band off so you guys can see it right here. This is the these are aluminum, and these go around the bird's leg and, and kind of crimped into place so that they they stay there. This particular bird uh, is a Swainson's hawk. It was banded in Southern California. 17 years ago 17 years now on average the average life expectancy for a for a swainson's hawk or, or most you know medium to large birds of prey uh, they're um 80 don't survive the first year so if this one survived the first year that's a that's phenomenal itself but then the average life expectancy for birds of prey like these is seven to ten years on average and this one was 17 years old. And not only was it 17 years old, um, from where this bird was picked up, there is a Swainson's hawk nest nearby. And so this was probably the female. And she was probably still breeding and raising babies 17 years after the fact. 
and so that's pretty darn remarkable. In fact, when we sent off the data uh, that we that we got off this band, we got an email back saying your data must be um, incorrect. That band is too old. And and so we emailed him back and says no, this is the band, and this and you know we've got the hawk, we've got the band. The hawk has been refrigerated in case somebody wants to 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 pick pick up this hawk. Uh, for for research, we we've, we've got it refrigerated, and then they sent the, an email back and says, "I'm sorry, that band is too old. I want you to send send us a picture of the hawk and the band, because they couldn't believe that that a Swainson's hawk has survived from for 17 years in the wild. So this is really a, a beautiful old lady, and especially when you understand that these Swainson's hawks migrate." Um, you know the the ones that we have nesting here in Utah. Um, they've been tracked all the way to Argentina for the winter, and so they have a very very long migration, and all of the dangers for 17 years she was able to avoid. Uh, so she's had an incredibly long life, and and I feel very very privileged that that I I was able to even though, you know she's passed away that I was able to tell her story and show her band and provide data back on her uh, because that's that's what the banding is for. You know, I get asked every, uh, quite frequently, you know, all of the birds that we rescue, do we ban them and do we track them? And it says, no, the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service does not allow us to ban the ones that we rescue. And the reason they don't allow us to ban the ones that we rescue is that um, they don't consider wildlife rescue as education, as an educational project. Um, we can band babies in the nest, and and again, chart their migrations when they you know when they end up end up dead. Then we get a little bit more data on them. We can tr we can band them on their migrations as they're as they're migrating through, um, and again put the bands on but they will not allow us to ban the ones that we rescue. Um, and, and so, you know, that's, that's the way the government functions. And, and I have to follow those, uh, those rules and regulations as well. So anyway, beautiful, sweet Swainson's Hawk. I, I'm, I'm sad that she's passed away 17 years. What a, what a wonderful, long, uh, productive life for, for a Swainson's Hawk. And I'm, I'm really thrilled with that. Other questions that I can answer for anybody? Okay, with respect, OCB with respect. asks, can I please preserve the Swanson's hawk? I would give it to my ornithology teachers. We can teach our students easier with close-up interactions with the birds of prey. Unfortunately, let me kind of tell you how this works. Um, if somebody wants this Swanson's hawk, they will have had to already have acquired the the necessary federal permits to, ha to have the, the Swainson's Hawk mounted uh, and used and for educational purposes. And so it's one of those things that, uh, you know, uh, occasionally I'll, I'll get a request from a university or, or, or some other educational organization that if, if uh, a specific kind of a bird comes in, they have got the federal permits necessary. But it takes, to be honest, it takes years. It takes years of paperwork. These are highly protected. It takes years of paperwork to get, to get the permits to do this, uh, to, to, to be able to take one. Uh, very, very few taxidermists in the country can, can actually stuff them because they have to have the proper permits as well in order to, to mount these birds. It, it is incredibly complicated. And, and so, you know, if somebody calls me up tomorrow and says, hey, I, I, I've got a permit for a Swainson's Hawk. But to be honest with you, this one was hit by a car. It's not a really, and that's, to be honest with you, you know, I put, I, I, I sock this, hood this bird and sock this bird uh, to show how, how, we, how we cast the birds for when we have to work on with them. We don't want to use anesthesia, but that actually hides the damage that was done, uh, she was hit by a car. Uh, and so uh, she really would not be a great um, 
candidate to be mounted anyway. Other questions? Carolyn asks, how do you preserve the feathers until you need them? The way we preserve the feathers is we basically, we put them in a plastic bag and we put them in a, uh, a dry, cool environment. Uh, and, I, and I've got feathers from uh, birds of prey, uh, but just literally little baggies full of, of peregrine feathers and prairie feathers and red-tailed hawk feathers and Swainson's hawk feathers and so on and so forth. Uh, that I have collected over the years, uh, and uh, and so just just a, a little baggie in a cool, dry place, and they they last for decades. There's some discussion in the comments about if a feather is pulled out or plucked out, can it be damaged beyond uh, growing back or being able to be repaired? Well, it can, and that's that's one of the things that, that I was worried about the red-tailed hawk that we have in that was hit by a car, had a concussion, while it was laying off the side of the road disabled, uh, somebody decided that they wanted its tail feathers and they ripped out all this, this red-tailed hawk's beautiful red tail uh, feathers. And when you do rip a feather out, you run the risk of damaging the socket, the cuticle that the feather grows out of. And if that is damaged, the feather will never grow back. And it's kind of like, I, I don't know if you guys can see on my thumb right here, um, my, you can see my, my thumb had uh, the, the nail damaged, and I lost the nail, and then when it grew back, it did, not, it did not grow back completely normal. And the same thing happens with the feathers. Sometimes the feathers become impacted. Uh, sometimes the feathers just flat don't grow back at all. Uh, so to um, rip out a feather, to expedite the process of a new feather growing back in, um, has a lot of risks involved in it, and it's also incredibly painful to the bird. And so this is something that I uh, would certainly discourage anybody from trying to do that. That's just not appropriate. We've had some requests to see Bell Scout and Helen. How are they doing? Bell Scout and Helen are doing very, very well. Um, because I, I, I set this up here, uh, I, and, and be, I needed both hands to handle uh, everything, but I did not bring them with me today. But I did bring a very special little guest, and I guess it's about time to introduce you to our, 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 our little guest that, that has just come in. And let me get uh, my Swainsons out of the way here. The pretty Swainsons, they're such a good thing. Okay. Now, forgive me, I, I hope I can do this properly. Um, this, after, or this morning, I, I got a phone call uh, from uh, a, a dispatch from the Cedar City Police Department that uh, one of their officers was called out to pick to pick up a baby hawk. And this baby hawk, uh, uh, someone had found it. We don't know who it was that found it. The officer didn't ask enough questions. We don't know exactly where the hawk came from other than it was in the Cedar City area. We've got a lot of Swainson hawk nests in the Cedar City area. And so the so I get a phone call from dispatch and uh, and I says, yes, I can take it. And then dispatch also sent the officer to the Utah Division of Wildlife Resources Regional Office. And so I get a phone call from the, the regional office. Do I have room? Because right now we are so, we have so many animals in rescue right now. It's just, it's just unbelievable. It's been the, the busiest um, late spring, early summer that we've ever had as far as wildlife rescue is concerned. And they want to make sure that I that I had room for another one, and I says, of course, I've got room for another one, and and so then they brought the the little hawk out to my home, and so we we've, we've got our new little friend, and uh, I'm trying to make a little bit of room here so I can turn the computer around, hopefully um, without knocking stuff over too badly. Let's see what we can do here. So I want you guys to see this is our our new new little hawk that we have. Um, just gotten in and it's being hand fed uh, for the first day or two. Can everybody see our little our little friend right there? Here we go. Now this at, at this age and this is what we try to tell people get people to understand uh, at this age um, they outgrow the nest. This is about as big as it'll get. 
even though it's about six weeks old, it's as big as it'll ever get. It can't fly yet. It'll be a little while before it can. It can walk, but that's about it. Baby birds outgrow their nest. This is normal. They end up on the ground before they can fly. This is perfectly normal. And if they're not in a life-threatening situation, um, we encourage people, please leave them and, and let mom and dad continue to do their job. Now, I have no idea where this one came from, so there's no way to get this back to mom and dad. Otherwise, I would have run out uh, this afternoon and got this little one back to mom and dad as quickly as I possibly could uh, so that mom and dad can confi- continue. Even though it was on the side of the road, we could have put it on the other side of the, I assume, a fence or the other side of the tree line or somewhere close enough uh, so that mom and dad could have continued to care for this baby. Uh, but we don't have that option. So this is another rescue that we've got. And this is the exact same hawk. This is a female Swainson's, just like the one that was hit by a car and passed away. And uh, this one, we will finish getting getting her raised up and get get her flying. But we got to get her in the wild uh, by the first part of September, because in September in September is when they start their migration, heading for for Central America. And I have brought with me because I don't know if this is going to work or not. She did take food from me earlier today, and so we'll see if we can get her to eat a little bit from us. And I don't know if she will or not. Like I said, she's completely wild, but we'll see what we can do. Hi, sweetie. Shall we see if you'll eat a little bit from me? Here we go. You want some? There you go. There's my girl. Yes. Now, a lot of people will ask me, you know, I'm hand feeding it, and doesn't that imprint them on humans? And isn't that a bad thing? Well, here's the the hope is that we only give them. There we go. We're only going to feed it today just to make sure that it gets plenty to start with. Um, Hopefully by tomorrow, um, it will be it it should be old enough to to take its own food. And so in the process of doing that. uh, From now on, it'll be out in the chamber and it will not see me provide food for it anymore. We want to give it as little to no human contact as possible, which is extremely important uh, so that it doesn't acclimate uh, an imprint on humans. And so so this is a rare occasion for you to kind of see this this lovely little Swainson's hawk um, being fed to captivity because like I said, that doesn't this doesn't happen very much or for for a very long period of time. We want these guys not to be acclimated to humans. A little one. Yes, we don't want that. There you go. And so just an extra special treat for all of you is to see this beautiful little Swainson's hawk that we're working on here. And I'm hoping that this is this is the last meal that, that we, it will be fed by a human being. And... Uh, that it will be able to give it food. Yeah. You had a pretty big meal earlier, so you're not terribly hungry. Maybe we could mention why you do not name rehab birds. Why I do not name rehab birds. Absolutely. Yeah, you've had enough. Okay, that's my baby. The reason we don't name rehab birds is because... We don't, well, first of all, I rescue, I've rescued thousands and thousands and thousands of animals in my lifetime over the last 50 years. And I certainly wouldn't have enough names, period. But also we don't name them because these are not to be acclimated to humans. And so I I don't want to have that human interaction. I don't want, I I don't want to feel um, emotionally attached to the animal. Because the goal is that this animal be completely wild, goes back to the wild, stays as far away from humans as, as, as possible. So it, that's, that's the important thing. And, and so we, so the, the, my personal animals, you know, Bud, you know, Belle, Helen, the, the personal Cody, our, our silly poodle, you know, the, the, I, I can, we can give them names. Um, 
we we can feel a friendship and a love and a companionship with them. But this Swainson's hawk, we don't want to do that. That's that's incredibly inappropriate. We want this Swainson's hawk to be wild. And so and so we the we just don't name them. And that's very important. Other questions? Are there any that you give plaques to? Any that we give plaques to? Okay. Um, here's the thing, guys. Um, we are... We, we now have over 91,000 subscribers to our, to our YouTube channel. And when we hit $100,000, we get this plaque along with some other benefits um, from YouTube. Uh, and so the hundred thousand dollar mark is kind of a really big deal. Subscribers, and, not dollars. And, yeah, subscribers. Hundred thousand subscribers is kind of a really big deal for us, and um, so we're kind of getting close. And and I think we feel that if we do get our hundred thousand dollars or a hundred thousand subscribers, not dollars, hundred thousand subscribers, um, the the most important. Uh, person in our, I don't know if it's a person, but the most important entity with, within our organization is, is my golden eagle named Scout. And, and um, you know, he is, he is truly one of the founders. He's an amazing wildlife educator. He's a dear friend. And so I would like um, to, to get that uh, 100,000 subscriber and have the plaque uh, dedicated to Scout, our Golden Eagle, and hang up the plaque in Scout's chamber. He would be the only only eagle in the world with a 100,000 subscriber plaque from YouTube. And I just think that would be really, really fun. And so if all of you would help us along just a little bit uh, and get your, your friends to subscribe, we can we can break this 100,000 100, subscriber mark um, you know, fairly quickly. Are you going to poop? Let me turn you in the right direction so if you do there's my baby yes you are you're gonna poop keep it i've got some plastic down oh that was just a small one you didn't shoot it out at all okay well thank you for being polite uh, and uh so that that would be just really really fun to be the only eagle in the world with its its hundred thousand subscriber uh youtube plaque i think that would be hilarious be fun to do to do that and so if you guys would help us that would that would be wonderful hi baby okay we're just a few minutes away from seven o'clock we have one question from Lori. she asks how will the little hawk learn how to hunt for food without mom and dad hawk in its life to show it hunting skills well and and see that's that's kind of a misnomer that people have they really don't get a lot of education from mom and dad um, the Swainson's hawk's a great example. The Swainson's hawk, when they when they start flying around, they follow mom and dad. If mom and dad fly down and catch, you know, a little gopher or mouse or something, these baby Swainson's hawks are so belligerent to their parents that basically they see mom and dad catch something, they'll fly down not to not to observe how to catch something, but to steal food from mom and dad. And um, and they get extremely aggressive to mom and dad. They, they abuse their parents horribly. They're flying around screaming like little monsters. And what generally happens is, is that um, the, the babies get so obnoxious to their mom and dad that the mom and dad will start migrating first. And so mom and dad say, to heck with this. I'm sick and tired of these babies beating us up, stealing our food, and mom and dad migrate, leaving the babies completely abandoned. Um, and it's a, it truly is a sink or swim. Um, e either they survive or they don't. This is why 80% of all birds of prey don't survive the first year. And then what's really fascinating is mom and dad migrate out, and then... You know, two weeks, a month later, the babies migrate out. And they migrate out alone with no instructions, no no information on where they're supposed to go for their migration. And somehow they're hardwired in their brains 
to be able to go on this massive <laughs> pace of out Yes, my girl. They, 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 they understand, and it's hardwired into their brains. It is not a learned thing that they, they head for Central America, and they spend the winter down there, and then at the appropriate time, they head north, and they will fly back without any instructions, without any guidance from anyone else. Uh, they will generally fly back to where they learned to fly in the first place. And, and then after a couple of three years, when they're old enough to breed, then they seek out a, a, a breeding territory that nobody else has claimed. And, and so there isn't a lot of education involved. Um, you know, th this, this little one will be put out in a flight chamber. This little one will be able to fly around, get some exercise, and it, it will get, you know, live food um, so that it knows, you know, what the appropriate food is. And then the and then the only thing left to do is give it this give it its opportunity the same opportunity that that all the other Swainson's talks have. And I know that sounds rough, but that's that's the way the the process works. Any other questions? Well, we wanted to end with a book, Amazon wish list, and Rodent Pro, right? Okay, book, Amazon wish list, and Rodent Pro. Okay, really quickly, uh, if you like who we are, what we do. Um, we do have a book. It's called Healer of Angels. Uh, the eagle is on the front cover. This is my Golden Eagle Scout. And if you get the book directly through us, and you know, you get the book at Barnes and Noble and Amazon, those kinds of places. If you buy it off our website, you get the autographed copy. And the autographed copy has Scout's footprint, which is right there. That is Scout's footprint. And and Susan and I autographed the book as well, but we did it in pen instead of our footprint. And uh, and it's 40 years of wildlife rescue work, the wisdom of grandparents. And the profits from the sale of the book go to our rescue center, where when you buy from Barnes & Noble and Amazon, we get 60 cents. And so if you buy it directly off our website, the price is the same. You get the autographed copy, and that helps us a great deal. Um, we have updated our, our wish list from Amazon. Uh, and so all of those who are, have been so kind and generous to, to uh, purchase items off our wish list and have them sent to us, we're so grateful for that. And so we've got a new wish list that's, that's up and going right now. And Rodent Pro. Rodent Pro is where we get our frozen rats, mice, and quail from. And you can go to our website, and the, inst and the instructions are there. Uh, you don't have to order frozen rats, mice, and quail. You can actually just go to Rodent Pro and order a gift certificate for whatever amount that you wish to, to, to donate. And then the next time we need frozen uh, rats, mice, or quail, we call Rodent Pro, and, and we've got you know so much money set aside uh, in donations for food for the animals. And so between those three things, thank you guys. You guys are amazing. We we appreciate all of our all of our friends out there that have been so helpful. Because of you guys, I can I can take care of these. You know this is this is uh, very very important to me, and without your help. I, I, I couldn't do nearly uh, what I have been able to do for the last 50 years. So thank you. Thank you so very much. Last questions before we call it a, uh, an evening? I think we can probably just call it. We can call it. Guys, thank you so very, very much. And, and we look forward to talking to you again soon. Bye.